Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to yet another session of Clinician Scientist Interactive Sessions. Uh, we've been uh, uh, delivering projects which of different interest both to the clinicians and scientists. We all know that the state of art of medicine that we practice today and we continue to practice in future not depends on what happens in the research activities that go on behind the scene. Fortunately, unfortunately, these research activities take a very long time and the entire process of science is very, very slow. For anybody to get Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the, uh, yet another session of uh, Physician Scientist Interactive Sessions. We have started these sessions quite a few months back with an idea to interact both with the clinicians and the scientists to get the best out of what we do on both sides of the medical science. The entire process of medicine and the clinical practice that we do today is basically the output of what happens behind the scenes, the output of the research that happens that gets translated into clinical science. Fortunately, unfortunately, the science, entire process of science and research is very, very slow. It takes years for the scientists to work on these projects to come to a conclusion which could change the entire concept of taking some aspects of surgery. This entire process of surgery is very, very slow and depending on the output of this research, what happens, it gets published and it ultimately gets transferred on to the clinical side. It changes the lifespan of several of the patients and several of the individuals. Fortunately, unfortunately, there are negative aspects of this, wherein a portion of these researchers who are involved in this active research could fabricate, could falsify could naturalize this information that we have to their own interests, which sometimes get published in journals of high impact and could sometimes get translated onto clinical medicine and which could have a deleterious effect on the clinical practice. This is basically done, most of the time it is done intentionally, not unintentionally, most of the time it is done intentionally. But this in spite of the fact that it goes through several editors, sometimes it skips through this and gets published into clinical medicine and sometimes it is shown to be deleterious. When it is picked up by the editors of high impact journals, it gets deleted even before publication and some of the articles are deleted even after publication. This sort of miscontent that happens in the research is quite rampant and it is becoming rampant in current clinical practice basically because people want to project themselves. So to take this discussion, we have some clinician uh, uh, scientists in our side who have been publishing very actively in high impact journals. We thought we would take their advice and then take interact with them to see what is being done, what can be done to avoid this and what should not be done in clinical practice. We have with us actually Dr. Rup Jodi, Dr. Anand Kulkarni, Dr. Nitin who are actively involved, but we have a very senior person here with us, Dr. Narsimhan, who has wide a cardiologist of known repute, who is actively involved in cardiac research publications, and he's got several publications to his research which have changed the entire concept of cardiology practice. I would like Dr. Narsimhan to give a brief as to what is happening in clinical research right now, what we anticipate, what we look forward from the instance, because we have a huge uh, audience of this PhD students who are here, who we have to give a proper attention so that they go in a proper direction and we get good results from the research that is actively happening. And we are very proud that actually we have a basic science department and also the clinical, uh, clinical department is actively involved in lot of research which is getting translated. But we also wanted to know the negative part of this entire uh, publication system. So I'd like to invite Dr. Narsimhan to take this forward. Good afternoon and 
the much uh, for the American invitation. Uh, it's extremely important to get this when you get into the research as a career. Community and trust are extremely important. Uh, even if I find something which doesn't fit into the general pattern of things, I will have a particular conviction to go ahead and report it, number one. Number two, don't have this uh, idea that we should fit into the general picture. The two applications say you know, that this is the finding and your finding doesn't go along with this. So it doesn't matter, we need to have a higher conviction to be slightly different. So again, it's extremely important and it's very simple. If you speak the truth, you don't have to remember that you're speaking. Because, uh, because I have to be out of the memory and I do not keep the out of everything. You just see what you have seen you are going to report it. And it's fairly simple. And years later, if the people do, someone will say yes, it would be years ago, someone has reported that. The classic example is some as a coincidence is uh, Catherine Greco and the uh, Weizmann's research, which was completely ignored for about almost two years, two decades. And to the extent that she was almost uh, not getting a new connection with the department. And thanks to COVID, the community became uh, well known all over the globe. And then the uh, research proved that it was a very rapid uh, product of vaccines which could uh, contain the epidemic. So, if you observe something different, have the, just verify once again whether there are any methodological concerns. Whether we are gone somewhere else. If it's something which is not fitting in with the general picture, have a kind of conviction to report it and keep moving on. And uh, the acceptance of these articles in previous journal is not an index of the veracity of the finding. Suppose the previous journal doesn't accept a particular article, that doesn't mean anything. Not a because the editors have different uh, constraints. For example, uh, uh, an editor publishing articles from the US may not find any kind of, uh, he may not even find the importance of conditions like tuberculosis, malnutrition, and any of the features of what we find in India. So it doesn't make any sense for us to publish it there. If you a local journal and as long as it's available for the rest of the world to see, you have to keep moving on. I think it's a unique opportunity for uh, students and faculty in this organization because I can't think of a better uh, atmosphere than what we have in terms of fostering research and nurturing research uh, than the available for us. And uh, wish you all the best. Just remain true to yourself and have the very information to present and publish what you find. Which are all this. Very good afternoon, ma'am. Okay, happy to see a bigger audience today and hope hope it increases.
date has opened, so I thought some misconduct happened in the pen drive. Finally got it. Just, just give me a moment. So I think I think uh, uh, this uh, this two months we are planning to uh, do topics related to research methodology and how to visualize the data. And um, I think the way to go ahead to this this would have been the best way to go ahead with. Uh, introduction by GV Dr. Narasimhan and talk something about research misconduct because uh, that is something that is concerning all over the globe these days. And so, uh, what we'll do is today we'll just begin with a short talk on the research, what, what research misconduct is all about, and then we can make it an open house. Even though we have mentioned a panel discussion, all of you can participate and give your thoughts and everything. Uh, so, so, what is research misconduct? So, this is actually an AI rendition of research misconduct. So uh, let me give a disclaimer. I'm not going to give ideas to conduct misconduct because I'll be showing some examples of how misconduct is done, what is it all about. So don't take it as an idea to do it yourself, try not to do it, right? So let me begin with a silly question. Just a raise of hands. How many of you have conducted or will conduct research to published papers? No one? Everyone? Good. Let me rephrase it. How many of you conduct research to answer a question? So, so which is more important? First question is more important than the second question. Exactly. So, what happens if you try to answer the first question? Publish a paper. It starts with a bias in your mind. You have a research question and you are already biased. And that is scientifically called a confirmation bias. It's a kind of a cognitive bias. So, you try to fit into what we have to certainly fit into whatever you find to the existing knowledge, which may not be correct. But if you try to answer a research question, even then you get a publication, but then you start with a blank slate. You have a hypothesis and then whatever data you get, you tend to publish. If you go with the first question, you will be reluctant to publish a negative study. But negative studies are as important as positive studies. But if you go to the research question, whatever you get, you will get the courage to publish. And that was not very eloquently so let's tell you about the story. So how many of you have heard of this person called Sean? He was a German physicist. Yeah, there is one person. Uh, so, so he's not a medical, so probably many of you will not uh, uh, know him. So he, he had published several papers in Nature and Science and the Big Impact Journals. And was claimed to be the world standard in quality science, discovered several things, several hypotheses, several uh, material, and we got some outstanding award. What happened for the years, some of his peers and other people who were in his paper had some questions. They were they saw some similarities between different papers, different research data. And then uh, that came out, uh, that was reported, uh, you know, the were doing, and then an investigation started. Uh, what led to that was, when we were asked to give his data, show his data to the investigators, the fact that, that he kept no laboratory notebooks, and his raw data had been deleted from his computer. There were hard drives, there were external hard drives, there were thousands of computers that have used it. So those, those kind of things led to suspicion and then uh, he lost his job, the Bell Lab uh, fired him and he had to withdraw eight of his papers. I'll come to him again at the end of my talk, but before that, what is research misconduct? What does it all mean? To put it in a very simple word, for a few simple words, it's just a behavior by a researcher, intentional or not. I mean, Dr. Jivira was saying many of them are unintentional, some intentional. So it may be intentional, it may not be intentional that falls short of good ethical and scientific standards. And what is the impact of that? If you see here, this is, there is something called refraction watch. You can find it in the net. It's a free software. You can find out what kind of paper has been refracted from which country during which it, that's a free software. So if you see that uh, this is data from 2012, this, this uh, x-axis indicates the refraction index, the y-axis indicates the impact factor of the journal. And as the general impact factor increases, the refraction rate also increases, the refraction index also increases, which means that the high quality journals, the quality of standard of quality they try to maintain. So many of these articles get through the review, peer review process, editorial process, but they come out later on and these journals do not stand back to 
brick back then. And this is uh, uh, how the data looked like. like uh, so they had uh, evaluated like over 2,000 interactive papers uh, from PubMed. 21 were attributed to L, 67% were attributed to misconduct. So it's a big number of inspection was because of misconduct. What kind of misconduct? There was a fraud or suspected fraud in nearly half of them. There was duplicate publication, plagiarism in 10. So this is one part of the story. But all plagiarism, all misconduct papers may not necessarily get retracted. Many of us may not even know that they So what is the impact of that? False and incorrect data circulates in academia. And those data will be used by future researchers for their methodology or they may base their studies on those falsified studies. So what we are doing, we may get a paper in a good journal, we may get a, we may, we may get lots of congratulations, but we are actually doing bad science and setting a precedent for bad science to pro propagate. So this is, I think, the bigger impact and the retraction from a journal. And that is one of the reasons why scientific misconduct should be strictly prohibited or prevented. So what are the types of misconduct? Again, we have heard these words, uh, data fabrication, data falsification, plagiarism, and then the peer review violation, this is another important aspect which we often overlook, inappropriate citation, then lack of ethical approval, many of the studies that are done with sloppy ethical approval, authorship issues should be there, give authorship, like I like one of my friends, I give him an author, or I am not good in writing, I ask someone from a different place to write and don't book him as an author, so that's a post authorship. Then uh, there, there could be several other undeclared information in the manuscript. So, a few, few common things, conflict of interest, most of the time it is said we don't have, but there may be some conflict of interest. Removal of the outliers, if you have a data set and some of the data set like, are outliers, like, they go right beyond the range. Those are not data to be removed. There are statistical ways to handle those data, and those outlier data may have lots of meaning in the final interpretation. So, do, those are all kinds of uh, undeclared information which amount to research misconduct. And salami slicing, you do a big study and then you make small papers out of that, like from one big study you publish five papers. Then you cannot, you cannot publish a big story, a complete story. These are bits and fragments which should not have importance. So this is salami slicing and again you can just pick up the good part of the paper and then publish, don't give the negative part, that's wrong. And the paper may have both positive and negative which should publish as one single story. So this is salami slicing. So if we take uh, both data fabrication and falsification, so these are in combination for scientific fraud. And if we add plagiarism to that, it forms the holy trinity of unscientific or only unholy trinity of scientific writing. So who does it? So this is basically uh, at individual level, so at uh, university level, so this is a study again, uh, quite old, this is my old slide, but there are other numerous studies which have similar kind of data. So if you see the distribution, the most common is fabrication or falsification, is uh, almost uh, three fourth or uh, two third, and thirty five percent is plagiarism. And if you see the postdoc amounts to twenty five percent of the misconduct. So this is basically from basic science, you not know, clinical studies, but similar number are also applied to clinical studies. And the graduate student has a good number. Senior, senior, even senior PIs have been found to cause uh, produce misconduct like around twenty percent. So this is kind of distribution. This may vary according to the situation, but then. The important of this figure is all levels of academia, all, all designations in the academia are capable or have done scientific misconduct. So that is the point uh, take home here. So let's do a little fun here. Uh, show you some picture and you have to spot the misconduct. Okay, so here are two images. One, one, one of the images published in uh, application of physiology. These are a big, big, uh, high impact journal than science. So, so where is the misconduct here? So both are exactly the same pictures. Both the pictures are exactly the same. Only some changes in the uh, label in, in this. Thing. This is minus eight. This is six. So minor changes. Yeah. Yeah. So one. Yeah. So yeah. So one is one thing, but the rest of the things are same. And both these papers are by Sean. They publish the same data in different papers under different headings. So a little bit of tweaking. So, so this is data falsification, right? So here, so we have lots of basic scientists sitting here. So, so is it a good image? Is there any misconduct here? 
doesn't look like right but journals are smart they have their own techniques so this is the misconduct so they have changed all the different characteristics of the picture so when it was put in some software so lot of change in the adjustment in the contrast was done and so this is this is how the actual thing like that is the mani manipulated image so now we should not dare to do this because because journal good journal has the place to find out misconduct so that that's the point here what is the misconduct here two papers on nature genetics on in science 2007 2010 few years after the name of the names of the plants are somewhat different Ma ma magnification is is acceptable i mean as long as you report that we have magnified this and this so okay. this is not magnified this is not misconduct but magnification is not misconduct exactly so this this if you this and this are same in the in one paper this was like so this one so it, now it, now we re realize that this and this are same right so in the next paper in science they have just rotated it so i think, I think the authors here are also same i'm not sure about it so so this, this, these are examples of misconduct so so whenever you see a picture or whenever you see when you review all of many of you must have reviewed papers so little bit of importance like if you pay some attention you can pick up things in the writing part in the images so that is important so that is the importance of equity of revision how how meticulously you look at your own paper or the paper you know, other paper you may read right so then what else few of the misconduct that can often happen in a clinical setting like ours suppose you have some missing data you are doing a good study huge huge data set lots of samples set, but some data are missing what to do about that how will you handle that so if you have a pressure pressure to publish from your boss there will be a tendency you can let's quickly like see the other pattern and make it up so that's a common tendency i mean it happens but that is wrong that statistical ways specific statistical ways of imputation by which you can take care of missing data right so these are the things that we will be discussing in a subsequent process uh, anand nitin myself and can invite others also so so that's how you take care of missing data it's not about just putting the filling the data randomly at your will or by seeing the patterns in the others right so so that if you do that that is a very strict research misconception then low rate of recruitment again you have Uh, to present a paper maybe after two months in a conference and you are not recruiting enough patients and there is a pressure from your boss okay you have to present this you have to do this there may be a tendency you okay, let's just increase the number by few, five or six or, or just start like, duplicate few patients like just copy paste few patients so these are natural tendencies this is a human mind when you should not face it but again that is wrong if, if we do not have the sample size then again then there are statistical ways to take care of that if, if you don't have the adequate sample size how to take care of them to mimic a result of the full sample size right so there could be issues with follow up you, you may not have a adequate follow up of the patient or you may not have all the data on follow up that's fine that that has to be reported in the paper when you make a table if you have a follow up of say only 18 out of 25 patients so you have to write in the bottom that 18 patient or so and so patient you could not have a follow up for so and so reason that is the honesty that 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 will, that will Uh, make the reviewers and the editors also believe okay these guys are genuine they are doing genuine work but if it looks like too good to be true and perfect follow up and all patients are coming on time on that that generates uh, like suspicion i mean right? so that is very important there could be technical issues like when we do randomized trials or technical or trials using methods or endoscopy surgery there could be technical issue there could be some protocol violation sometimes we may not be able to stick strictly to what we have written in the protocol If if that is not severe enough to affect the result, that is fine. But it has to be reported in the paper, in the discussion or in the diagram or figure or table. It has to be seen that, that, that because of so and so reason, this this thing could not be followed exactly as it, it was proposed earlier. So those are important things. So if we do this, that, that, that's how we are preventing research misconduct. Okay. Then let's see about plagiarism. What is plagiarism? We all do plagiarism actually. Even when we email, we sometimes copy paste. So the the most common and easiest plagiarism is copy pasting, right? So it, it basically means the use of others published or unpublished. That is important. Ideas or words. Words are okay, but even ideas. If someone gave you an idea, and tomorrow you go to a talk and say, "I discuss this," or write a paper that I have done this, that is plagiarism. Even ideas, 
stealing of ideas or intellectual property is considered plagiarism as long as you do not attribute or take permission. But if you say that, okay, so as well as allowed me to talk about this, or uh, I'm talking about this, but this idea is for so and so, that is not plagiarism because you're giving the due credit to the right person. So it's okay to talk about others' ideas, it's okay to talk about others' papers, but as long as you give the due credit. But, so then it does not amount to plagiarism. And many a times uh, you would use your own stuff, own research stuff from one paper, you use the methodology of the other paper. That also amounts to self plagiarism. And then uh, nowadays there are lots of plagiarism uh, checkers. When you submit a paper, I, I'm sure most of you have experienced this. There will be a small number, like 25 percent plagiarism detected, 35 percent. So up to 10 to 15 is okay. 20 more than 25, then it is amount. It amounts to real plagiarism. So how to prevent that? So the best way to prevent is not to copy paste. But unfortunately, the copy paste is the most common type of plagiarism. So the lazy plagiarists to do that who don't want to write or paraphrase their things. The Canadian plagiarists will do by tweaking the sentence, they will not copy paste directly. Again, I am not teaching you this. You should not do this, but I am telling you how plagiarism is done. So they will copy paste, but they will tweak the words, and that's how. It appears that they don't, can't get caught, but still they can get caught. And that's what you do I mean plagiarists. And for the careless person who do not think them just random review is accidental plagiarist. So the most important thing what I tell my students is I do that if I have to write a method of a paper which I have already published, I can retype the method with a copy pasting. So then the paraphrasing. So then the chances of the same to say copy paste is not there. Because methods we cannot avoid. I mean, methods will be same. But if we type it or rewrite it without copy pasting, then the risk of the percentage will come down the 25 35 percent of plagiarism. So, why people plagiarize? That's important. So, pressure to publish again, you have to publish within so and so deadline, you have to, um, otherwise, in, in many places, actually, publication is associated with an incentive. And in many universities, if you publish two papers, you'll get a promotion, you'll get a high. I think that is not correct because in, in many places in the world, in some places, it may not. But in many places, including India, that happens. With, with, with that, because everyone wants a promotion, everyone wants a hike in the salary. So with that incentive, they will do it a fast track mode, copy paste, plagiarize, falsify. Lots of research misconduct happen. Lack of training, we have never been trained about plagiarism. Even now, I'm sure all of you may not have the full knowledge of plagiarism is. I mean, many of the casually just do a copy paste, even without thinking that that is wrong. I mean, that, that has become a part of our daily life. Right? We will copy paste WhatsApp messages and send you copy paste emails and send to these are plagiarism. Right? So then again, many of people from the Eastern or non-English speaking countries uh, have limited English proficiency and that's what leads them to uh, plagiarism. But now there are mechanisms of using services of English, native English speaking people for your papers so that that can be taken care of. And then it to show plagiarism that what I just told, influence of cultural values, but many times we don't think plagiarism is an issue. I mean, we just do it as a part of our daily life, which we should take care of. So now, uh, what about peer review violation? Is there violation in the peer review process, which is supposed to be very, like, full of sanctity, and then it's blinded, double blinded, triple blinded, but it happens. So there was this nice uh, article in New England Journal of Medicine several years back which talked about uh, the hacking this scientific publication process through peer review fraud. And actually what happened is this is, uh, was published in Science. There's a journal of tumor biology which retracted 107 papers by Chinese authors between 2012 and 2016. Why? If you see here the authors Suggested experts to peer review their paper, but they gave their own email IDs or their own friends' email IDs. As a result of which, those papers were, were separated between their group. Sometimes, even the authors themselves peer reviewed their own paper. So, that was what the letter in the tumor biology journal rejected 107 papers uh, from that uh, journal. So, so, and many, of the, many examples are if you go to the net and just write peer review violation or ethics, I mean, thousands and thousands of articles will come, even in PubMed, very good quality articles. And then the other thing is, this is also very interesting, very old event, 1978. 
So any GM send a paper to this guy, uh, a paper to review. And again, this is a common thing. He passed on the paper to the junior colleague called Soman to review the paper and they rejected the paper. After a few months, what happened? American Journal of Medicine sent the original author a paper by Soman. So what happened was they rejected the paper and Soman wrote the paper in his name and it happened to go to the original original author of that paper. So, so this is, so what does it amount to now? What kind of research misconduct happened here? Let's do this quiz. So there was plagiarism because already written paper was again resubmitted by another author. There was fabrication. There was some kind of change in the data or fabricated some data to make it look different. And then there was a violation of the peer review process. So what I personally feel and this is a common habit, even I faced that when I was in US doing my postdoc. My PI used to give me papers to review which came to him. To a certain extent, the career is fine, it was not experience, but if it sent to some junior students, pioneer students, I think I think that, that that's a serious research misconduct because that student won't have the wisdom that the senior professor will have. Right? So so again that, that's why I think this is a serious misconduct we should be avoided. I mean, if I give a paper to review to someone like Chandan or one of our gastro colleagues, it's fine, they know the subject. But if I give it to one of my research coordinators who don't have an idea of the subject, that is research misconduct. And that kind of practice should be avoided. So, what does the industry do? So, again, uh, do you know the story of Rosenblitz and what happened? It was like there were lots of FDA things that removed and all those things. Do you know what happened? So it was launched by GSK in 1999 and then there were several reports of cardiotoxicity. So in 2003, the Osala drug monitoring group of the WHO contacted GSK about those adverse events and they did a meta-analysis 2005 and 6 and actually demonstrated that there was a real risk. But GSK knew that in 2005, like uh, long back. But even after knowing that the medicine was circulated, people took it and side effects happened. Well, there was a conflict of interest. They spent billions of dollars in rosipitis and development. So if they say that they are adverse event and will stop the drug and they run a big loss. So, so this is a serious research misconduct. They have hidden their research findings because of conflict of interest. But this is what the industry does. The research misconduct is not only restricted to scientists, but the industry will also do that. Again, the depression story, uh, 2008, uh, the publication stages of all the clinical trials of antidepressant that came to market between 87 and 2004 were evaluated, uh, reported to the US FDA. So there were a total of 74 trials, more than 12,000 participants, 38 trials had a positive result, 36 had a negative result. So all the positive results that paper were published, one was an abstract form and all the others were full, full articles. The negative results only three were published in full. 22 of them were lying in the FDA files. They never were published. They, the data were in the FDA files. They were negative studies, so never published. And 11 of these negative studies were published in such a way that it appeared to be a success story. So what is the meaning of this? So if you do a meta-analysis of this, that will be a positive meta-analysis because all the positive papers were published. But if you see the negatives and positive studies were equal, so from that perspective, the antidepressants should not be working in these patients. Again, this is data, I think the data. Right? So I took these examples from this very nice book called Bad Farm. I think all of you should read sometime. Um, lots of these examples will be there how plagiarism and how research misconduct and things like that happen. And then the other, other, other um, interesting story, and this is not from any book, this is my own personal experience and not in the industry. So uh, they approached me and few others from different parts of the country, India, uh, to do a study on the profile of uh, patients with exocrine insufficiency in the country. Like we did a uh, good study, fairly good study, seven eight centers were there. And once we submitted the data, we had a research coordinator involved. And once the uh, data was ready, we gave it to the industry company. And there was silence, nothing was there. And suddenly, accidentally, I went to see after maybe several months, 
that the paper was in Japi, the Journal of Indian, I mean, physicians of Institute of Physicians of India. And like, this was the paper. I was the first author, and Dr. Rakesh Kocher was the second author. And then other people are from the industry. The other investigators from the other center in India were not there. So I talked to the editor of Chappi and I told this is the story. Then he said everything is like people of this correct. So I asked him for the because whenever you publish a paper, there has to be like a uh, this copyright transfer. There has to be a peer review process where the authors are supposed to see the peer review and respond to the comments. Nothing happened. What I saw was the paper in uh, on that. So when I asked the editor and then he said, okay, this you guys have uh, written, this copyright has been signed, but this is not my signature. Neither this is Dr. Rakesh Kocher's signature. He is one of the uh, co-authors. So the industry people or someone somewhere has altered signature and published a paper. We did not get a chance to see what was the data, how the data looked like, which means that because of their conflict of interest, they must have published or produced the data in their favor. So that their products can get sold. Right? So, so this, this is a serious violation. So immediately as uh, asked them to retract it, it was retracted. But these kind of things do happen. So so many of you are involved in at some level farmer driven trials. So we have to be careful of what you are expected to do, or you have to be very careful at each step. You have to keep the control in your hand, not in the farmer's hand. And therefore, that, that's why I don't prefer to do farmer driven trials. What I prefer is the, like uh, individual, I mean, uh, investigator initiated research. So there we can maintain the integrity of the data, maintain the transparency of the data. But if we give, give the control to an industry, I think uh, the problem comes there. Then, um, what the, how is the general involvement in research misconduct? Again, unbinded peer review. So only the authors do not know which review, but the editor and, and the reviewer knows whose papers he is reviewing or she is reviewing. If it comes from a very big name slab, there will be an inherent bias. Immediately you think, okay, this is a good paper. And if you see something wrong also, you may not have the courage to say that it's wrong. And ultimately it gets published. So, so I think the review process should be double-blinded. Few journals are there, but very less. In, inadequate quality control of the review, just like the Soman paper, that friendly gets Soman paper review. The, the journal cannot control the peer review process by the review. I can give it to anyone I want. I think the journal's problem is they don't accept negative studies, which is again a problem. If you accept negative studies, then only there will be a balanced interpretation of the data. If all studies are positive, one negative, for example, mm. meta analysis may not show you the right result. But I think editorial biases are there. We have many of our papers, many of you must be experiencing this. Reviews are good, but they do not go, they do not get published. Why? I have the opportunity to talk to some of these, maybe. Nitin and might also talk to them. So they have a bias. They say that there is a bias from papers from India and China. This is clearly what editors have to do. Right? So, you know, so, so this is editorial, and it's not that all Indians and Chinese do bad science. I mean, for a handful, for 5-10% of people, the research community gets a bad name, which is unfair. And then there are predatory journals. I think now everyone gets emails every week, two or three, from two or three journals, like uh, publish a paper free or very low price. We we'll publish in five days, ten days, all rubbish. So, so uh, maybe I can share this list of predatory journals to all of you later on. So you can find out which journals are predatory. And it's increasing by the number every day. So what is the situation in India? It's not that, I mean, uh, researchers in uh, overall. So if you see this uh, from 2020 to 2022, China was the country where maximum retraction happened, more than 1600 papers, and in India around 500 papers. Not necessarily medical, all, including all, depart all departments. And if we look at the medical side, the reason for retraction and misconduct in Indian studies, that 55% of research misconduct was gift authorship. You, you just made authors to someone whom you like, some professors to just please them or make them happy. Which is wrong. If there is no contribution, he or she should not be an author. Period. Then, uh, seventy percent of the researchers do not have a knowledge of publication ethics. I think this is a sad state of effort. There should be classes in medical colleges. Already in the medical curriculum, there should be classes which teaches research ethics, which teaches what is plagiarism, which teaches how to publish papers. 
So this thing should be incorporated in the medical curriculum, that's what I feel. And then again, less than 50% of participants did not have any idea of plagiarism. In fact, 5% had a favorable attitude to a plagiarism. That's what plagiarism is a good thing, it can be done. That's funny. And this was another study uh, some time back, um, which looked at the randomized control trial, the industry-driven trials, uh, and the type of misconduct. And if you see here, the most important majority of the misconduct was in the informed consent form. So you are either not telling the subject the actual thing what you are going to do, what, what is the intervention, what are the adverse events. So 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 that that, that is one of the things that is uh, wrong, and there are many many other things in the ICF that. Uh, uh, is incorrect, then uh, to limit the documents. And if you see here, uh, uh, data appear to have been deliberately omitted, or uh, if, if the data does not look good, they are not filled in the uh, this thing, the case record form. So those, those are the type of misconduct that happens. And again, if you see here, used ID, misplaced in pristine condition means. You have recorded that okay, this particular patient has got this medication, so he, his medication container should be empty. When he comes back, he should bring it to empty container, but those are pristine. Those, that number in the container the patient's uh, research ID, like, you, you see that the medications have not been used, but it has been recorded and used, and you will have uh, data of the patient's also after taking the medication. So, so these are some of the different kind of misconduct that happens. Not only in India, I think it will be happening all over the world, but this study happens to come from India, from Indian studies. So, just to summarize uh, why it is done, again, we have discussed this earlier. One is poor supervision, then too much of academic pressure. In our situation, too much of clinical load, so not much time to devote to research load, lack of interest, incentive of eroding financial gain. Uh, so all, all, all these things we can discuss more in the open house uh, after this. So uh, what I think is uh, in an in a institute like uh, AIG or any academic institute, the most important person to lead the research and regulate the research is the principal investigator. Usually the groundwork is done by the DMB students or the clinical coordinator. But uh, and, and if the PI is not aware of what is going on, the, the uh, students can tell you anything and we'll be bound to believe because we don't know how it is. So that is why the close contact many I'm telling this because we, we have noticed this and most of you like the DAP does some project, after two years they will come and the data are ready. There is no communication between the PI and the every frequently there should be communication, data should be checked and that is very important for the PIs to do. And that, that would definitely lead to a very healthy and transparent research culture. And how to prevent, maybe we can discuss this. Uh, many of the things I told again, we can discuss. I'm not taking it for this slide. Uh, if you are presenting some image, there are image rules how to uh, present the images. There are appropriate statistical methodology to deal with uh, missing data, to deal with uh, deviation of protocols. Everything has a system, just, just we have to follow that. Plagiarism checkers are all about uh, in the internet. We have to or we can use those things. Uh, so, so these are a few things. Again, maybe we can discuss it uh, further. But I think I think AIG should have a like research regulatory cell so that all the research protocols or what we basic says we can go through that data are reviewed. Not that you have to just meet some once in a while from senior people who are experienced should be part of that committee, and then there should be. Uh, frequent uh, review of the data and so that will keep the integrity of the data the transparency. Data transparency is very important and at least a few key people in the study should know the data, you have access, should have access to the data. Okay. So finally, last two slides, what happened to Sean? Right. He did lots of things. So there were 24 allegations against him, uh, substitution of data, unrealistic precision of data, data contradicting known physics, 16 were upheld. Uh, and in 1st November 2002, eight papers were retracted from science. 2003, seven papers were retracted from nature. He lost his job. His PhD was cancelled. His peer review rights were gone. And he lost all his rights to right grants. So, punishment to this extent can happen if there is research misconduct. And now, it is since Literally, it's available all the time. With one click of the button, you can get everything. You can get full text of articles. So, there could be many people who can whistle do. 
So if you do something wrong, initially it may appear okay, she can hold you, but there are people. Some, someone who don't like you may know who said that there is a misconduct here. But that is possible. So it's very important to maintain the research sanctity. Be transparent in the data. There should be data transparency. The methodology has to be very clear. What do you do? How do you do it? There could be protocol violations. That's not a big thing in research, right? but it has to be documented. What the protocol violation happened and what was done to so this kind of transparency, if it is there, then I think papers will get published in a respectable journal. So maybe uh, rather than doing questions, can we do the panel? Uh, I'd like to invite Nitin and Anand and several so people can also join in. Mithunia. So I mean, it's open for all. So anyone can ask or suggest so that. Uh, we have around 15 minutes. So can I help? Yeah, sure. You can even come here. It is some... I think it's all good. The addition of having, of having a regulatory cell is very good actually. Yeah. Uh, you remember, we had constituted one publication company. Yeah. Yes. We, we are submitting, I think, Nitin, Dr. Nitin, Dr. Roop and the statistician for the present is in the company. I think this needs to be regularized first. Yeah. Second thing is uh, to go ahead forward. The data being uh, prepared for a manuscript should be presented, as you said, uh, at least in a small group who, uh, who, who can comment on the papers. That that uh, needs to be definitely established. And I think that is more important than the publication of the committee yeah. because what we see in the committee is the paper after everything is done. We don't, without knowing how it was generated, how it was written, the same product, but then we have to take care of the building blocks. Yeah, that's what, now the data to be presented before, the, even in this, uh, uh, our Thursday meetings, the data can yeah. be presented, whoever wants to write. Now yeah. that way we can improve our uh, research also, yeah. publication also, journals that we publish also. True. So I think this, this needs to be established yeah. now. Yeah. I think this is, uh, this is called research in progress. Yeah. So research in progress should be ideally within the department. Because I've seen IIP happen in Singapore and they were huge because sometimes the gastroenterologist is giving comment on a cardiac topic. So research in progress should be within the department. It should happen within the group of people. So it should not be general in the entire hospital. Because I've seen it happen and they actually retrieve it and get it into a departmental thing. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, I think I think I agree. I mean, monitoring should be there from day one of the research, right from the study design. I would say. So what if uh, in my case, what I do is the patient has not followed up with us. Yeah, it has created a negative outcome. That is, the patient has to be accepted in survival. The patient has not followed up. I can accept. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there there even the capital number even put that as a cancer. So instead of that, that's a very statistical method. I mean, there is nothing wrong in that. That is correct, right? Yeah. So I was wondering, you know, what 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 to work on this idea of legalism? You said there is uh, also idea of legalism. We go somewhere, we discuss something, and then later on we see that there is two ways on this, or somebody has. So you can patent, I have heard a problem, I don't know about I mean, my friend has a lot of patents here, she so told me that you can patent an idea. Once you have an idea, you can apply for a patent and the idea remains for one year. It's your idea in them. So you can explain how you will sit on it for a long time. Don't you have your ideas which we need to work at the time, you have a good idea to be shared and other people can patent the idea that you can build on it and write something. Boils well, down to your individual integrity. I mean, if your person is having his individual integrity, he never see your idea, he will acknowledge you. So, I think to a certain extent, the moral value comes with individual integrity and morality. Sir, uh, you, you brought a majority of part in the research uh, standard. What I wanted to say is that. Non publication is also misconduct. Right. If you have finished your study and you not publish, that's also misconduct. Right. Like maybe it's negative study, small sample, whatever, you should publish it. True. So, do you think most of these non funded studies 
other ones which are misconduct because you don't know the finance to implement to this sort of data anything like this patient go because a prevailing in the center of uh, where patients are paying from the pocket in their internalization also that is where the problem starts so funded that is yes it's it, it's it, it's a yeah. sir Hmm. Um, let me just backtrack because even randomized trials are ultimately being proved wrong. So it's not a very great. Second is some small clinical observations which have completely changed. I do it in the case in cardiology. One or two case reports have changed the paradigm how we think about the whole issue. So I'm sure it is happening day in and day out, like last week or the week before, when the neurology was presenting, we thought we need to really get into a, a rapid sequence mode of uh, following up this uh, metagenomic NDS and other things. So I don't think we need to, first of all, uh, randomized, not randomized trials, Unless we have the industry backing, you cannot have sufficient sample size and other things to do. Yeah. And uh, so it's better not to get into this unless you have sufficient funding. But where we can really make a difference is good clinical observations which have completely changed the pattern. It may be once in a year, it may not be a good idea. But the rest of the years, it has changed. Um, so I'll give you just a couple of examples. For patients with uh, severe flow heart rates or uh, sudden fluctuations in heart rate, it used to be always a pacemaker and other things. And we had a small cohort of patients with severe among vegetarians, deeper deficiency producing significant post-cardiac bacteria. Similarly, a thin barrier. Patients were referred for pacemaker where we felt it was not required. Now, it's common knowledge all over the country, we immediately evaluate for this, for veteran pain, and then it's just, it's not a memory study, it's not in any way, but it's just in the practice pattern of the rest of the country. So, any, anyone wants to add anything? Yeah. Yeah. Mark, Mark. Just one second. How do you, uh, I see most of the research from basic science? Do you think is the, there is one person on Twitter I see and uh, picking up these figures and saying that this is plagiarized, this is plagiarized. The figure which you showed, I could actually identify how to, are there any software just to do that or the intuition done? I think we can get worried about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, even for plagiarism, if you read a few articles, you can't change the definition of the case, you can't change the definition of yeah. heart failure or something. The, and majority of the software is also because of that is a pleasure. That's why there is a limited ticket 20 percent you can go ahead. But if you want to reduce plagiarism in your writing, the best part is you read 10 articles, close those articles, don't do, keep it on those PDFs and write it on your own. Then you can reduce your labor and to 10 percent, 15 percent, which is acceptable. Great. So I have a question. Uh, like uh, AIG supporting us uh, with like kind of a publication committee, and even if we are coming out with some ideas, we can apply for grants. But uh, can AIG support us even with patents? Because uh, then the whole scope that we have like uh, good ideas and which can be patented. So, can AIG support us with that? I think the question is directed to the wrong manner. We should direct it to the right manner. I think the same way we have some. That's the important thing. Most institutions have a particular policy. They are still probably very mean that we should think about it. My thing is, what I think is a unique idea. We all inherently we have a bias. So, it is vetted down by a committee, is it really unique, is something which we should really go through all the five payments. So, from your point of view, there are several payments which are lying down in the 30 years, 30 years, we will never see the library. 
So then a male came saying that there is an error and they were somebody has pointed this out. And he came on the editor and I just replied that this is a typology error, that will use correct. Then the immediate thing I wrote is and the original data set. We need to verify and if you for a night, cross check and cross check and cross check and send it and then accept it after that. So the data set has to be perfect. You cannot just manipulate it and put something in the paper and you can never do it 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 and just send it. Just wait, it happened to you. But it happened smaller than 0.01 extra there. And it's just that you can turn it out. So is it is it safe to put your data there during submission? Depends where you spend it. So like suppose I use SPSS. SPSS gives whole lots of yeah. data and all the points. Maybe something like now people how the sample size is calculated. They they have to get into supplementary material and send to the uh, like really so people track not data and have data set also. Not data and just keep it there. Not the 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 data and just keep it there. Given TGA format, given the model data, just given TGA format, not the TGA format, TGA format. Oh. And that, that is really interesting in here, no good point about the premise. I was just wondering whether today, whatever it is today, it is not done with natural intelligence. Do you think some sort of artificial intelligence will create into this and they start scaling all the papers to scale? It is likely that you will see how some of these things are there today. But you think any any data to show that any AI yeah, is not incorporated into this through scaling or otherwise? So right now there are no problems, but some journals are starting. They are thinking they are trying to screen for different kind of misconduct and it is it is doable. It can be done. It's a so some journals are considering actually. Uh, how do you want to come up with Yeah, and I think uh, in the way it's not a very nervous. Um, as long as we observe something unique, you believe even if it's a single case report, don't fall into the trap that you need to have a large randomized trial and that is one that is the highest, that is what has been rated as the highest level of evidence. But if you look at it, all that it needed was five culture plates for Fleming to say that penicillin was responsible for this. And it was responsible for a few soil samples. People have come with statins. So careful observations of few data sets, it is enough to report. And don't have this hierarchical thing that uh, I need to do a multicenter large land randomized trial. Even a single case report well documented, that would be a good starting point in your career. Trying to find different kinds of patients. Eventually, they may show sure would be the same trial, but in the real world, most of the time it doesn't work. If you see the real world, scenario, yeah, if you hit it on the nail, because a drug being effective or non ineffective was repeatedly coming on this p value. But now we understand why a particular drug works in a particular population, not in certain population. For example, ACE inhibitors works very well in Caucasians doesn't work among blacks. Diuretics works in blacks but doesn't work so well in other population. I mean, we have, if you ask any anesthetist, they will ask a question, do you belong to a Vaisya community? Because of the cholinesterase that is there in the thing. So these personalized observation will come from clinical observations. That's why it's fundamental that we need to get involved and uh, report as and when what we see and we say a particular drug it doesn't work very well in this population but works very well in this population because of genetic polymorphisms later on the explanation will come agree so i think uh, it was a great session thanks to all the panelists and the audience for the participation uh,
so we'll close today and next next uh, on 12th we'll have a very interesting talk on how to publish in high impact journals by the editor of uh, Lancet Gastroenterology and Hepatology so all of you are requested to come and it will be in the auditorium on 12th so we'll see you next Thursday thank you <laughs>